We're very happy to have Mike Riddell here uh, for you, and uh, we're going to do a little interview about exercising and using an insulin pump, which happens to be the topic of a new book that he wrote. Uh, to begin with, what do you know about type 1 diabetes and exercise anyway? Well, I've been living with uh, type 1 since the age of 14 and uh, struggling with exercise um, right through my, my schooling. Um, getting diabetes actually increased my uh, drive for research and for schooling. So I went to, to university and I became a professor. And I do research now on the effects of exercise on type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Something about a, a sports camp that you've been running, I believe? Yeah, so um, one of the things I founded a few years ago was a sports camp for kids with type 1 diabetes who are physically active and trying to learn a bit, bit more about their exercise management. And uh, actually because of those kids that I met, I switched to an insulin pump myself. And uh, we also have a, a hockey camp now called D-Skate, which focuses on uh, both parent education and kids' education around exercise management for type 1. Great. So my understanding of what's going to happen today is you're going to give us a few of the key insights from the book, and then if people want more, they can uh, get the book and uh, uh, maybe get involved in some of your programs as well. Great. Uh, do you want to walk us through what's the uh, what's the first thing that you think is important for people to know on this topic? Well, we start off in the book talking about what I call the the physiological replacement of insulin for for exercise and sport. When we exercise and we do different types of sports, uh, the insulin changes are quite rapid. Sometimes they go up and sometimes they actually uh, go down. So in the book, I talk about different forms of exercise that people like to do and how to replace their insulin more physiologic compared to just taking you know one needle a day or not changing their pump settings. You mentioned that some exercise might make uh, blood sugar go up and some might make it go down. Yeah. Can you unpack that a little for us? Sure, so uh, what we've learned is that different types of stress hormones are activated during some uh, types of exercise that are really intense, so competition stress, uh, maybe diving, maybe um, a hockey game where you've got short shifts, but really intense effort. And those hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, they go up. And they actually can cause blood sugar to go up a couple of millimoles or a few milligrams per deciliter. So in those situations, uh, you need to ratchet up the insulin a little bit, mm -hmm. either just before or soon uh, after in recovery from those types of sports, or you'll have high blood sugar for hours. Okay. And uh, is there another type of exercise that would drop blood sugar? Sure. So what I find, and a lot of other people find, just low-level activity, even if you're, I don't know, going out for a walk or gardening or, you know, in the grocery store, that type of activity tends to be associated with a drop in blood sugar. There's really no adrenaline, unless, of course, you know, you're having a golf game and you're really frustrated with your performance. There's really no adrenaline to keep the blood sugar up. So you go for a jog, you go for a light bike ride, blood sugar tends to crash. And that's because our muscles are very insulin sensitive when we do those types of aerobic exercise. It just soaks up glucose like you wouldn't believe. So if I'm doing something like weightlifting, uh, CrossFit, yeah. sprints, yeah. uh, push-ups, those kinds of things would tend to spike me. Right. And if I'm doing something like swimming, uh, hiking, jogging, uh, even just goofing off and being active, those things would tend to drop me. Right. Is it, uh, this is a, I think a, a general principle, is it, is it also person specific as to, as to what exercise does what? Yeah, we have done a number of studies over the years and what is incredible is how individual we are with respect to our blood sugar responses. And I think you probably know that from all the people you've met. Some, some people have a real tough time with low blood sugar and, and exercise, and other, other people just don't. So uh, inter-individual variation is one of the things that is really fascinating. We're all very different in how we respond to, to stress, to exercise, and to insulin. So I think it's important uh, when you have a book like this to realize that you need to come up with a customized plan that, that works for you, and it may not work for me. Okay. And so if I'm a, I'm a person trying to figure out what various exercises are going to do to my blood sugar so I can do them well and, and safely, yeah. what do I do? So what I like people to do is they have a little bit of a diary where they put together the, the type of exercise they do, when they do it during the day, and how much insulin they have on, on board at the time. And you can, if you're on an insulin pump, you can easily look down and see how much insulin you have in the circulation. 
If you're on needles, it's a bit tougher, but you can still figure it out. So with those three variables, you begin to map out with routine what tends to happen. So let's say you're training for a bike ride and you know, you've got a few weeks in, in there of training. The more information you gather on those three variables, the better you can fine tune it. So when you finally have that big raise, uh, you're gonna be much more prepared. Except that sometimes what we do in practice doesn't work when it comes to competition, again, because the adrenaline or some other stress hormone might kick in. Okay, and what were those three variables again? So for, for what we know, it's the type of exercise they do, yeah. uh, when they do it, the time of day, and how much insulin is in the circula circulation at the time of doing that activity. And so if you take an injection of, of insulin or an infusion of insulin, it peaks in about an hour and it lasts up to four hours, maybe even five hours. So knowing when it goes up, when it peaks, and when it comes back down helps you to figure out when is the safest time for you to exercise. If you have a low, for example, you're going to want to exercise when that insulin is starting to come back down or almost back down to, to zero. You still have some basal insulin, but that mealtime insulin can cause the problem. So I feel like you've given us a lot already because I know I was... Um Gee, probably 12 years into diabetes and exercise before I realized that uh, weightlifting spiked me and, and cardio dropped me, and this yeah. is why I was I was going wonky. Um, we just finished a study, Johnny, where we had uh, individuals with type one do weightlifting first, and then they did their jogging, and okay. we found that that balanced the blood sugar better because the weightlifting kind of kept the sugar up for that uh, that aerobic phase. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if it sounds complex, it uh, is. that's what the book is for. Yeah, it is very complex. And I'm learning a ton from people like you who I've met over the years who've done some amazing activities and sports. So uh, I can't thank you enough. No, no. It's, uh, uh, I think the more information we have, the better we're able to take care of ourselves. So, so thank you. So let's talk about some of the new tech that's out there now. Uh, I think in particular you have a bit in the book about CGM. Right. What is it? So uh, CGM stands for Continuous Glucose Monitoring. And it basically is a little implant, a little sensor that can measure your blood sugar in real time and report it on some device every five minutes or so. So it's, it's sort of your blood sugar on the fly, on the go. What's happening to it? Is it steady? Is it going up? And is it going down? And we find that this type of technology is probably what's going to help develop the artificial pancreas. If we can sense glucose and measure it all the time, then we'll be able to come up with some way of infusing the exact amount of insulin you need for whatever it is you're doing, sleeping, exercising, eating. So give us a bit more uh, technically on what a CGM tells you and beyond that how it's useful to someone who's exercising. Okay, well, um, a CGM is, again, a little sensor that's placed underneath the skin and it's reading current, it's reading electricity. And... Uh, the more sugar you have in your system, the higher the current, and that can be reflected in a blood sugar on, on a meter or on a, on a pump. And many people who we profile in this book use CGM a lot if they're doing competitive sports or exercising, because you know rather than having to stop, poke your finger, kind of guessing if your blood sugar is going up, this device you can just simply look down at, and, and you can get an idea of what your blood sugar pattern is, is trending towards. So we've, we've seen that if you're using this technology, you can prevent a low long before it happens. And also overnight, if your blood sugar tends to dip after a tough day of exercise, uh, this, this CGM can alert you that you're going low or maybe even turn the insulin pump off automatically. How often do the current CGMs give you a blood sugar reading? Um, about every five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are, there's the newer technologies coming where it'll be every one minute, but I don't think... I think five minutes is probably good enough. You know, when I was first diagnosed, I was testing, you know, once or twice a day, and, and it was a test that took about five minutes just to poke your finger, put that blood on the strip, wait a couple minutes, wipe the blood off, and then look at a color change on a strip. So it's amazing that technology's come this far. Looking at the book, you have uh, uh, not only nice color and uh, is it well written, you have athlete profiles. Um, people that you and I both know, yeah. and you, you, uh, it seems like they are providing advice from the things that they've done? 
Yeah, that, that's what's, I think, so neat about this book. Having met so many people with, who've done amazing things, uh, people like Chloe, you know, that they've founded organizations, they've led uh, huge sled dogging events, or whether you're a cyclist or, or whoever, uh, you can learn so much from these people, some of the things that they've figured out about their own diabetes, we can test in the lab, and then it, maybe it's translatable to other people with, with diabetes. And that's sort of one of the inspirations for the book, is all the people I've met. So you have the, the wisdom and insight of an uh, uh, NHL hockey player, an Olympic yep. rower. Weightlifters. Weightlifters. Bodybuilders, yeah. And then it's run through the filter of a, of a medical professional <laughs> so that we know if it's good advice, I suppose. Well, you get lots of advice when you have diabetes. And some of it's great and some of it's not so good. And, and often when physicians um, have, a, have a patient who has type 1 diabetes, They'll refer them to another patient who they think is similar in, in their, you know, sport mindedness or their, their, their background. But I think this is a better approach because you basically have a, a bunch of different athletes and then some research behind what they do to make sure that it has some practicality. Because the best advice you get is really one that comes from someone who's got a little bit of education but also some experience with this, with this complex disease. Sure. And that said... You've had it since you were 14. Yeah. You look like you're doing all right. Yeah. Uh, how do you keep happy, keep fit? Well, I, I love to bike to work. You know, driving in Toronto is a disaster. So I get 30 minutes uh, of biking to, to my work and 30 minutes uh, biking home. Okay. I also love running in the ravine system in Toronto. I love to play squash. We play tennis sometimes. And... Uh, you know, if I can get an hour's worth of exercise every day, uh, I'm a pretty happy, healthy guy. This is interesting because a lot of people have to force themselves to exercise, and it can seem like such a hard thing, and yet you're talking about how much you love it. Uh, yeah. Any thoughts on that? What's going on there? Yeah, I, I do feel sorry for people who hate to exercise because it is it can be painful and frustrating and time-consuming, but... You know, for me, it's just part of men it's part of my mental health, my physical health, my whole my whole well being. If I don't do it, if I'm stuck in an airplane, let's say for 12 hours, flying overseas, I feel awful, and I just can't wait to to land, put on some running shoes, and go for a walk or for a jog just to explore. I just it's it's part of my routine. If you get out of your routine, or if you have to start something new, how long does it generally take before you love it? Um, that's a good question. I, I think it's important to try new things all the time. Like I, I, I took, I took up, um, squash some years ago and I hated it at first because I couldn't really keep the ball in play. Right. But after, a, you know, after a couple of months, you, the better you get, the better you get at something and the, the more you like to do it, I, at least I hope anyway. Okay. So give it a couple of months. But I don't take myself too seriously on any one thing because that can also be frustrating. Like if you want to be the best golfer in the world, but you're not playing great, it can be very frustrating. Sure. I just do it because I enjoy it. Okay. I think that uh, anyone looking to get into exercise with or without type 1 would do well to follow your lead and yeah, have fun with it and, uh, and be educated and understand it. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Nice. Cool. I think that works well. Yeah. Yeah.